This has been devastating to every progress that we've made in the past decade or two. Yeah, yes, yes. And, and just back to, oh, hang on a second, let's listen in. and singer-songwriter who currently appears as a character on the Fox television show Empire. Defendant Smollett currently resides in an apartment in the Chicago Streeterville neighborhood. The people expect the evidence to show that on Tuesday, January 22, 2019, Defendant Smollett received a written letter at the Sin Space Chicago Film Studios, which is the facility on the southwest side of Chicago where the Empire television show is filmed. This letter contained written threats directed towards defendant Smollett and contained a then unknown white powdery substance. The letter also contained cut out letters pieced together which stated, Smollett Jesse, you will die, black F, and the word MAGA was handwritten on the envelope where the return address typically is located. This powdery substance has since been determined to be crushed ibuprofen tablets. The letter also contained a drawing of a stick figure, which appears to have a rope around the neck and a gun pointed towards it. Law enforcement authorities were contacted, and the letter was turned over to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which is currently conducting forensic analysis of the letter. In January of 2019, and at all times relevant here too, Defendant Smollett was close friends with an individual by the name of Abimbola Abo, Asandero, who was 25 years old. Smollett and Abel initiated their friendship in the fall of 2017. During the course of this friendship, defendant Smollett and Abel socialized together, exercised together, as well as worked on the Fox television series, Empire. Within that working relationship, Abel was a stand-in for a character named Kai, who is a love interest of defendant Smollett's character on the Empire TV show. Additionally, text messages between Defendant Smollett and Abel revealed that Abel was a source of designer drugs for Defendant Smollett. Specifically, since the spring of 2018 and on several occasions, Defendant Smollett requested Abel to provide him with Molly, which is street name for that narcotic ecstasy. Text messages generated by Defendant Smollett to Abel, specifically starting on the morning of January 25th, 2019, revealed defendant Smollett asking Abel when he would be leaving on his trip to Nigeria. This trip was scheduled to take place on the evening of January 29th, 29th of 2019, and it had been planned by Abel and his brother, Ola Benjo Ola Alcindero, who's 27 years old, two months prior. After Abel confirmed the date and time of his trip, defendant Smollett texted Abel stating, might need your help on the low, you around to meet up to talk face to face? The two then made arrangements to meet at the Sin Space Studios that afternoon, where Defendant Smollett subsequently drove Abel home to Abel's apartment in the Lakeview neighborhood. During the ride, Smollett indicated to Abel his displeasure that the Empire Studios, of the Empire Studios handling of the racist and homophobic letter he received three days prior. Defendant Smollett then stated that he wanted to stage an attack where Abel would appear to batter him. Defendant Smollett also suggested that Abel's older brother, Ola, assist him with the attack. Defendant Smollett had met Ola on several previous occasions through Abel. Additionally, Ola had appeared as an extra of the Empire TV show. Abel and Ola are both dark-skinned black males born in the United States with Nigerian descent. When Defendant Smollett and Abel reached Abel's apartment at approximately 5 p.m. on January 25, 2019, Ola, who was then living with Abel, was summoned into Defendant Smollett's vehicle. Once inside, Smollett asked Ola if he could trust him. When Ola said he could, Smollett detailed his plans of the attack to the brothers. Smollett stated that he wanted them to appear to attack him on the evening of January 28, 2019, near his apartment building in Streeterville. Defendant Smollett also stated he wanted the brothers to catch his attention by calling him an Empire F, Empire N. Defendant Smollett further detailed that he wanted Abel to attack him, but not hurt him too badly, and to give him a chance to appear to fight back. Defendant Smollett also included that he wanted Ola to place a rope around his neck, 
poured gasoline on him and yelled, this is MAGA country. Prior to the brothers getting out of Smollett's car, Smollett provided Abel with a $100 bill to purchase the rope, gasoline, ski masks, gloves, and the red baseball caps, which resemble the ones that say, make America great again. The ride from Sinscape Scoot Studios to the Osendero brothers' home and the meeting between Smollett and the brothers is corroborated by CPD pod videos and cellular phone tower data of Smollett's phone number. On the late morning of Sunday, January 27, 2019, Smollett drove his vehicle back to the Lakeview neighborhood to pick up the brothers and show them the scene where he wanted the stage attack to take place. Smollett then drove the brothers then drove the brothers to the corner of New Street and North Water Street in Chicago where the staged attack was to take place. This was just outside of Smollett's apartment building. Further details were provided by Smollett which included that the staged attack was to take place near the stairs on the southwest corner of New and North Water Streets at 10 p.m. the following night. Smollett also instructed the brothers not to bring their cell phones with them. Smollett directed the brothers' attention towards a surveillance camera on the corner, which he believed would capture the incident. There was a change in the plan in that bleach was going to be used instead of gasoline during the simulated attack. Smollett then drove the, the brothers home and provided them with a $3,500 personal check made payable to Abel, which was backdated to January 23rd of 2019. On the morning of January 28, 2019, the date of the planned attack, the brothers purchased the clothing items at a local beauty supply store and the rope at a nearby hardware store using the $100 bill that Smollett had given them. These purchases were corroborated by surveillance video and a receipt. Abel also deposited Smollett's check that same day in his own bank account. Later that evening, the plan had changed and the time of the attack had to be pushed back because Smollett's flight into O'Hare Airport from New York had been delayed by four hours. Smollett's plane eventually landed at O'Hare at 12.30 a.m. on January 29th of 2019. At 12.49 a.m., there's a phone call between Smollett and Abel, which lasted three minutes. During this call, Smollett told Abel the attack would take place at exactly 2 a.m. at the location. Minutes later, Ola ordered an Uber rideshare to his home to leave for the crime scene. Cell phone records and Uber records confirmed this call and the Uber ride. The brothers then took the Uber to the 1400 block of North Wells, where they exited the Uber and flagged down a taxi, which took them to within three blocks of the arranged scene at approximately 1.22 a.m. The taxi's in-car video captures the, brother flagging, the brothers flagging the cab and riding in the back seat. From approximately 1.22 a.m. until approximately 2.03 a.m., video evidence showed the brothers on foot in an area bordered by Lakeshore Drive to the east, Columbus Drive to the west, Illinois to the north and Chicago in the Chicago River to the south. Video evidence also showed that Smollett returned back to his apartment from the airport at approximately 1.30 a.m. At 1.45 a.m., Smollett left his building to walk to a nearby Subway restaurant at Illinois and McClure Court. At 2 a.m., the brothers were at the intersection of New Street and North Water Street. However, defendant Smollett did not arrive at the preset time. The brothers then proceeded a quarter block north and waited near a bench until Smollett arrived, which was four minutes later. Surveillance cameras captured the brothers waiting at this location just prior to the staged attack. During Smollett's interview on ABC's Good Morning America, which aired on February 14th of 2019, he identified the people shown in the still of that surveillance video as his attackers. Also during that interview, Smollett indicated he was positive these were his attackers. The two men in this video are in fact the Osendero brothers. It was at this time that the brothers staged the attack of defendant Smollett, just how Smollett had instructed them. While the stage attack was occurring, a witness who, as, who is an employee of NBC News Chicago had just parked and exited her vehicle around the corner from the location of the stage attack. 
This witness indicated that she heard nothing at the time of the staged attack, despite the fact that Defendant Smollett told CPD detectives that his attackers were yelling racial and homophobic slurs at him, and he in turn was yelling back at them. The staged attack lasted 45 seconds, and it was just outside the view of the desired nearby camera that Smollett had pointed out to the brothers approximately 15 hours earlier. Approximately one minute later, video evidence showed the brothers run from the location southbound towards the Chicago River and westbound towards Columbus Drive. Video evidence also captures the brothers entering a taxi at the Hyatt Regency Hotel across the river at 2.10 a.m. Video evidence then showed at 2.25 a.m. the brothers exited the taxi on the 3600 block of North Marshfield Avenue and walked northbound. This was only a few blocks from the brothers' Lakeview apartment, which was also the original Uber pickup location to the staged crime scene. Video shows the brothers walking from where they were dropped off towards their home. Two minutes after the brothers exited the taxi at 2.27 at a.m., Defendant Smollett's manager called the police to report the incident. At approximately 2.42 a.m., Chicago police arrived at Smollett's apartment. Chicago police observed that Smollett had a rope draped around his neck. This was captured on police body-worn camera. Seconds later, Smollett asked the police to shut off their cameras. Smollett then made a police report where he claimed he was the victim of an attack in which the offender struck him while yelling racial and homophobic slurs. Smollett also reported that the offenders placed a rope around his neck, poured a liquid chemical on him, and told him this is MAGA country. Defendant Smollett also reported for the first time that three days prior, on January 26, 2019, he received a phone call from an unidentified phone number in which an un unidentified male caller stated, hey, you little F, before ending the call. Smollett also told police that the incident happened near a camera, which he stated should have captured the attack. This is the same camera that Smollett pointed out to the Osandero brothers in preparation of this staged attack. Smollett also told the police that the initial and primary attacker, now known to be Abel Osandero, was wearing a ski mask which covered his entire face with the exception of his eyes and the area all around his eyes. As stated earlier, the Osandero brothers are dark-skinned male blacks. During the Good Morning America interview, Smollett stated, and it feels like if I had said I was a Muslim or a Mexican or someone black, I feel like the doubters would have supported me much more, a lot more. These statements by Smollett further misled the police and the public to believe his attackers were white. On January 29, 2019, at 7.45 p.m., just less than 18 hours following the reported attack, Defendant Smollett placed a phone call to Abel, and the duration of the call was five seconds. Two minutes later, Abel called back Smollett, and that call lasted one minute, 34 seconds. The brothers then boarded their flight to Nigeria and left the country. On January 30th, 2019, at 1046 a.m., Defendant Smollett called Abel, who was in Istanbul, who was in Istanbul Turkey, and the duration of that call, that call lasted eight minutes and 48 seconds. For the next two weeks, Chicago Police Department investigated this matter as a hate crime. The Chicago Police were able to identify the Osandero brothers as the alleged attackers through an extensive investigation using surveillance videos, pod police videos, in-car taxi camera videos, ride share records, credit card records, bank records, and a store receipt. On February 13th of 2019, the brothers returned from Nigeria and landed at the Chicago O'Hare International Airport and they were detained by U.S. Customs. Members of the Chicago Police Department placed them into custody. That same evening, the Chicago Police executed a search warrant upon the Osandero's brothers' residence where they recovered evidence that linked Abel to the Empire TV show. The police had already determined that Ola was affiliated with the show. Following their arrest and through consultation with their, with their attorneys, the brothers agreed to cooperate in the investigation. As more evidence such as text messages, phone records, social media records, bank records, 
surveillance video and the receipt from the purchase of the rope was obtained by investigators, this investigation shifted from a hate crime to disorderly conduct. The Cook County State's Attorney's Office approved charges yesterday at 6.10 p.m. and at 5 a.m. this morning, Defendant Smollett was placed into custody at the Area Central Police Headquarters. Thank you. You're not taking questions? All right, well, uh, you, you want a detail? That, that's some detail. That's this chronology of this fake attack, and that is the result of good old-fashioned uh, police work. I've got Faith and Mark and Adrian, and Mark, I want to come back to you because, I mean, you heard all the evidence. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. There they are. There they are. Hang on. Oh, here's his family. Here comes the family. Ryan, I hear you. So right now, right, so this is the uh, Smollett family right now. They're all standing here. Obviously, I don't think they expected to have to walk through this gauntlet. Um, I'm not sure if they're going to come to these mics. Uh, we're hoping that Smollett's lawyer will come and at least address some of this detail. Um, that was amazing in terms of the information and detail that we just got. I mean, trying to trick, go through this story for the last three weeks or so. Yes, we got some details, but nothing like that. Um, you can see all the extensive work that's been put into this from detectives to even them uh, interviewing all the witnesses and all the search warrants they performed. I'm sure what's happening right now, there is a conversation going on about whether or not a family member is going to come to the mic and talk or whether or not a lawyer is going to come and talk. It would be great to have someone come step to the mic, especially after all that information, Brooke, that just dropped. I'm sure your mouth probably dropped like mine did in terms of some of the information that we were just told. Yeah, of course. And, you know, I was sitting here wondering how, you know, these, his, his lawyers, correct me, Ryan, but I mean, most recently just still calling all of the claims outrageous, outrageous. And I just sat here wondering, little... hang on, let's, let's see. So, oh, nope. They're, that's an about face. Let's see. Are you going to walk by? Okay. So what's happened right now is the lawyers and the family have split. So you have, <laughs> you have the attorney. You have the attorneys go to one direction, and now you have the family going the other direction. I'm not sure they're going to be allowed to go out any other door besides the door that this front door is right here. Like sure they're going to have to walk past y'all. Sheriff's Department. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, it might come down to the point where security here has determined with the amount of crush of media and people who are kind of just watching, maybe they decide to let them go out another door. I doubt that's going to happen. We were told there was going to be no special um, treatment. Uh, of the of the family members here and considering all the cases that we've covered here everyone has had to walk out this front door at some point or another um, no matter how hard it is and of course we're here to ask the questions and of course we'll try um, but they do have plenty of security to keep us back to a certain point there is a line here that we can't cross in fact you see that gentleman right there I call him the warden. He takes care of these hallways. He makes sure it's all clear <laughs> um, as we cover our cases here. So you see them moving people who have nothing to do with this case out of, the, out of this way. And I can't even see the family anymore. But let's go back to that because when she was talking about the phone calls and, uh, and, and the illicit drug use and, and, and how detailed this was and how they picked a camera, this was amazing in terms of just how they laid it out. And I, I'm not sure if we've ever been to a, a day where you had two back-to-back -back news conferences. I really think this is sort of the city pushing back toward having this allegation, especially uh, during Black History Month, a noose, the words that were used, the outpouring of support, people who are in the federal government saying that there needs to be uh, federal oversight over this investigation. And I think you're basically seeing the city saying, no, we didn't need all that because we don't have these issues. And it's playing out just the way he maybe didn't want it. So um, I'm going to try to stand up in a second. I don't know if I can stand up because if I stand up, Brooke, in the control room, every camera person in the city will yell at me. So, <laughs> I don't want you to get no yelled at, Ryan Young. We, we like you I a lot. Not, so yeah. stay, stay down <laughs> for me, and, and we're going to stay in close contact with yeah. you. Let me, let me just continue this conversation, and as soon as you, you get anything, just kind of wave your arms or, or jump in. But, but you know, Faith and, and Mark, just on the legal okay. piece of this. And, and, and Mark, actually, can you just take us inside? I mean, obviously, the, 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 the lawyer for Jesse Smollett, I mean, they... they they, they know the ins and outs of this courthouse. They, they've got the family there. I don't know if they're sort of hiding around the corner, and I don't know where Jesse Smollett is, but, but what are the decisions that are happening right now uh, with, yeah, the, with, with a, that well, side? 
Yeah, I'm sure they made the decision not to talk. There's nothing that they can say or no question that they can respond to in response to all of those facts that were just laid out. I'm a bit surprised that they separated from the family because normally the lawyers will offer and help protect the family. Whether or not that was strategic to get one of them out of the courtroom or out of the courthouse a certain way, so be it. But at this point, after that evidence, and I say wait until most of the evidence is out, there is now enough out there that I truly believe it is time to cut your losses, work something out with the state quickly, try yeah. to avoid the felony conviction because becoming a convicted felon in this country still causes an enormous amount of negative uh, and try and work something out to maintain his liberty so he doesn't go to jail, although the cops are gonna be very frustrated with false police reports and get this thing behind him okay. as quickly as possible. It's not gonna get better. Um, Adrian Gibbs, I uh, appreciate your patience through all of this. And, and, you know, you and I were talking earlier this week and, and you know, you were just on the set of Empire in January and talking about how, yes. how the, the respect that, that Jesse Smollett on set was, was getting and how... Um It's $3,500 and a check uh, seems really bizarre. Also, you know, I've interviewed Jesse for stories about World AIDS Day and for general coverage of Empire, where he's an actor and he's also directed an episode or two. And he is super, super smart. He is super smart. And uh, people I, who know him far better than me, who are his friends, have said the same. He's super smart. Come back, come back. So uh, here's come the family. Back. Just as the we're check. talking, we're just wondering. Here's the Guys, family. come on. We got you, Ryan. We're here. Here's a family walking out. They're walking out the door. We have another camera outside. So there's probably about 100 cameras outside right now that's waiting for this family to get outside. And so there's a crush. Um, they are kind of stuck in the middle now once they get between this exit. If you look outside here, there is a swarm of people. I don't know how they're going to make it to the car without being um, just sort of mobbed. Um, there are more than 100 cameras out there. I think it just shows We're on the power it. We're on it. We see of the Jesse's outside story. Look at this. There you go. Um, I think that the, the power of Jesse's story and how many people cared about this is unbelievable. Um, this touched all the rails in terms of, of what people thought. And then the idea Hang that on a second, the story Ryan. may let's, have let's been just manufactured. Give me, give me one second. Let's just dip into this real quick. Watch the stairs. Give us some room. All right, Ryan, we're back. We're back. What were you? You were making a point. Don't tell me. We're with you, Ryan Young. Ryan Young, can you hear me? We're, we're just taking this. Uh, we're taking the. the I this. can. Yeah, it's, again, it's, it's unreal, yeah. and, I, and I will tell you, as, as, a, as a reporter who's done that before, it's, it's tough to do those. You don't like doing that, but this might be the only chance we get to talk to the family. I, Nick Watts back here. What sort of struck you about what we just witnessed in terms of that, the crush and the, everyone just running after the family right now? Well, I mean, we were thinking that we might see Jesse Smollett. Listen, the superintendent of Chicago police this morning said, we are pissed off. They are really annoyed with Jesse Smollett for doing this. So, you know, one thing that the police can do is that they can then parade him out in front of us. But the sheriff's department's actually in charge of this courthouse, so that didn't happen. So we have not seen Jesse Smollett, but we just saw the family looking pretty much the same as they were in the courtroom, stone-faced. And, you know, a couple of other details that we just heard there, that Jesse Smollett had asked those brothers to buy red hats to look like MAGA hats. That was something that has struck me again and again since I was in there, that he was really, Ryan, just directing this whole thing. And, you know, he pointed out that camera, and then when he was giving his police statement, he mentioned to the police, oh, I think the attack was probably caught on that camera. Those are the things that are really sticking out to me right now. You know, what scared me was the idea, especially being from the South, the idea of a noose and gasoline being poured on a black man uh, shakes me to my core. 
Um, the idea that you go to some communities and people talk about that was the lynching tree and that would be very scary to know that someone could try to invoke those feelings in the country, especially when we're moving to a point where people are talk, trying to talk about lynching in a different way. Uh, the drug use was also something that stood out yeah. to me as well. But listen, I just want to mention that, you know, we had a conversation the other night where I said, I hope he didn't fake this. And you said, you know, for a black man, I hope he did in a way, because the thought that that could happen is very, very shocking. The drug use, yeah. So they, so Smollett apparently started his friendship with this, these brothers in the fall of 2007, and the text message evidence shows that he, one of the brothers would supply Molly ecstasy to Smollett on occasion. So that's another connection between the three. You know, the thing that stood out to me, and I heard some conversations earlier, so many people love Jesse, and I saw the outpouring of, of support for him. Um, being in Chicago, people love the show Empire. Um, I actually got a chance to go to one of their premiere parties one time, and you could see the people who just wanted to meet him because he was more than an actor. He was someone who actually took a position, and he wanted to be a part of the community. This is devastating. I, mean, I think that that's was one thing that his lawyer was saying. He said, listen, he has lived here for a number of years. He is embedded in this community. He does philanthropic work. He is at his core a good person. And of course, the lawyers are saying that this you know, chain of events that we've been told by the prosecutors, they're saying our client is innocent. And they said this morning, you know, we are going to aggressively fight this. Yeah, Brooke, I'm, I'm at a point where I'm almost at a loss for words because I really want to ask the question, why? Um, I don't know if we'll ever get to ask that question. I don't know if we'll ever hear from it. Um, but, you know, when you talk to people who know him, they have such an outpouring of support and love for him. You can only wonder what's going through his mind right now. I feel for his family who's going through this as they mm -hmm. walk down the street there and, and everyone's asking questions, right? Like, we want to know what's next. No, and you heard the, the police superintendent, who was pretty phenomenal this morning, you know, saying, I I'm, I'm praying for him. Uh, he's angry, but he's praying for him. Guys, you all have been phenomenal through this whole thing. Uh, I want to thank you so much uh, for that scene and Jesse Smollett there in Chicago. But.